That's dancer, you know, bang, bang, dance, dance, you turkey. <clears throat> um, I'm going to talk to you about a difficult topic today, and uh, I thank Orlean for inviting me here to discuss this. Uh, she found out that we we're on the same page on a couple of things. Uh, this is Orlean's book that's available over here on that side. It's called uh, Just Say No to Big Brothers Smart Meters. And uh, it's a great uh, compilation of articles and discussions and emails and so on that um, <coughs> kind of summarize the anti-smart meter movement in Northern California, right? At least in Northern California. And so this, this is a very good thing. I know it's available for basically cost over there. I want to say up front also, I, I prepared a special uh, set of papers here for attendees of this conference only called uh, Technocracy Papers. That's also available over there. I'm not going to put a, any mandatory cost on it, but I'd like you to drop something into the little uh, plexiglass bucket to help pay for expenses, okay? So if you only got a nickel, okay. If you got five bucks, that's better. Uh, <laughs> if you got ten bucks, I'll even dance <laughs> for sure. Um, those of you who know me a little bit, um, and some of you do, uh, know that I have been pounding the pavement for almost 35 years on the issue of globalization, the global elite, and in particular, uh, the machinations of a group known as the Trilateral Commission. And um, I worked in the early years, back in the 70s, with uh, a gentleman, a professor by the name of Anthony Sutton, uh, who I met right as he exited uh, Stanford University, where he worked as a research fellow for the Hoover Institute for War, Peace, and Revolution. He was forced out because of the nature of the material he was writing. Make no bones about that, it was. And uh, he was very, um, rather uh, depressed to have his academic career ended rather abruptly. And we met uh, sort of by chance. I, it wasn't chance really in a divine sense, but uh, we met by chance in New Orleans. I was from Phoenix, Arizona at the time. And we realized that we talked a little bit that we had an incredible story um, under our hands, uh, our feet, with this new group back then that had just been started called the Trilateral Commission. And um, this was a group, not government, it was a group of 300 people from around the world, uh, well, actually about 186 to start, today 300. And there's about one third of them from the United States and one third from Europe and one third from Japan. They met in plenary sessions to discuss and hammer out policies and uh, they uh, voted for consensus and they went back to their respective countries to implement the policies that they had uh, basically created in secret. We found that they had released a, a plethora of written information. Uh, nothing was ever hidden in particular, um, but Sutton knew how to get a hold of this stuff, so we got all their papers, all their published material, all their recordings that we could get our hands on, and we sifted, we analyzed. Um, Tony was known in those days as the human vacuum cleaner. And he had a penchant for drilling down into the details of minutia that you, you know, mere mortals would not want any part of, but he did. And we discovered that this group had as an intent to create a new international economic order. That was their words, not mine. New International Economic Order. It was later shortened to New World Order, uh, mostly by George Bush the um, first when he started referencing it as the New World Order. But the New International Economic Order was a phrase created to uh, to guide their entire uh, their entire future. All the policies they wrote were were scoped around that phrase. And we thought back then that, well, okay, this must be some kind of a rearranging of the known order into some other order. In other words, uh, like the deck chairs on the Titanic. Uh, it's still a boat, it's still deck chairs, and people still go out to sun themselves, but they're just going to be on the other side of the boat, not this side. So we figured that based on what we knew about economics, and uh, Sutton was a professor of economics, by the way, we figured that what we knew about economics uh, that would be somehow rearranged for their benefit. In other words, they would get all the money and we would end up being the paupers. And that's generally still kind of true uh, in, a, in, a, in a broad sense. Three years ago, I'm almost ashamed to say, I was doing some, uh, some research and some reading and 
And um, I ran across a, a historical study that I had never ever heard of before called technocracy. Uh, any of you ever heard of technocracy in this room, that phrase before? Okay, maybe it's as a result of some of, what, uh, some of what I've written. But I'd never heard of technocracy before, and I was rather ashamed that I had missed such an important historical event. I'm convinced that Tony Sutton knew nothing about it either, or we would have been talking about it a long time ago. But technocracy as an organization was a group that was founded back in the 1930s in the heat of the Depression. And this was a group of scientists and engineers and, and uh, no politicians to speak of, but scientists, engineers, technicians, and so on, that believed that, tech, that uh, capitalism was dead and that the resulting society needed to be managed by experts, that, that is them, the engineers, the scientists, and the technicians. And so they started this popular organization or popular movement called Technocracy, and they actually incorporated it, called it Technocracy, Inc. And you're thinking, you know, what, what, what kind of nonsense is this? Well, uh, the nonsense of it is they had over 500,000 card-carrying members across the country in the course of about 18 months. Back then, the Hollywood Bowl was just been, had just been built. Some of you have been to the Hollywood Bowl. You know, it's a big, uh, it's a big place. It's, uh, uh, the stadium there is big, and I don't know how many hundreds of people it fits, but I ran across a picture of one of the early Technocracy Inc. meetings in the Hollywood Bowl where they were all down front and everything and the picture was taken from the back of the auditorium and it was chock full of people. It was one of the most popular uprisings that our country has ever seen. Unfortunately, it was cracked, but that's another story. Um, <clears throat> but we had missed technocracy. Technocracy had some, and I'm going to just discuss this here and give you some slides in a minute, but technocracy was a movement that the world thought died in 1940, 1942, 45, somewhere in there, for, num for numerous reasons. I can't go into them now. But it was removed and scrubbed from history. However, because of its uh, academic beginnings at Columbia University, no less, um, the formal movement of technocracy kind of died out, although the organization is still in existence today. It's up in uh, actually physically based in northwest uh, Washington state. Um, the movement as a philosophy lived on at Columbia University in the halls of academia. Can you picture that? Where the professors are still kind of talking about this stuff along the way, even though they're not allowed particularly to use the word technocracy. They're talking about the concepts and looking back at it, the how, you know, how uh, ingenious it was. And so when we come to the Trilateral Commission in 19, you say, what's this got to do with anything? When we come to the Trilateral Commission in 1973 when it was formed by two people, Zbigniew Brzezinski and David Rockefeller. Now, David Rockefeller, I'm convinced, never had an original thought in his life except just to own everything. Uh, they're masters at hijacking any kind of a good idea that's out there. And this idea of technocracy was an idea that I believe that, that Rockefeller and his crowd ended up hijacking for their own benefit. And you say, why do I say that? Zbigniew Brzezinski wrote a book in 1970, excuse me, 1969 called Between Two Ages, subtitle America's Role in the Technotronic Era. That meant nothing to me back in the 70s. It meant nothing to me in the 80s or 90s either. Until I started studying technocracy and really, and, and, and I did study it. I was a fanatical for a while. My, my wife will testify that I went crazy for about 18 months studying technocracy. Um, what I found out, looking backwards now at his book, looking at what I discovered historically on technocracy today, is that Zbigniew Brzezinski was a technocrat. Now, you have to take my word for now until you go and research the work on my website, augustreview.com and augustforecast.com, and read the technocracy papers over here. You'll have to read this material and absorb it for yourself, but I am firmly convinced that Zbigniew Brzezinski was a technocrat and that if he had been alive in 1930 at, during that movement time, he would have been a member of Technocracy, Inc., and he would have been leading the charge. And um, so I went back and I reread his book, Between Two Ages, in light of what I learned about technocracy and all of their original writings. And lo and behold, I find out that the book just parallels exactly what they said in 1932. You follow what I'm saying? 
Okay? Same themes, same concepts, in some cases the same phraseology. He just used the word technotronic to replace technocratic, you see. Similar, but not quite the same. A uh, similar concept, absolutely the same concept. So <clears throat> I want to show you today, uh, gonna, going backwards and forwards a little bit, a little bit about smart grid. I want to show you that smart grid is a subset of technocracy. Smart grid is local, national, and global. This will absolutely blow your mind, but you'll see where we're going here. Smart grid is interdependent with sustainable development and global warming this part and parcel of the, of, the, of the whole mix that we're talking about here. Now let me define briefly, just, just to kind of give you an idea, what is smart grid? This is an industry definition, not mine. I didn't make this up. This, this comes out of, in fact, everything I'm showing you comes out of their literature. A smart grid delivers electricity from suppliers to consumers using two-way digital technology to control appliances at consumers' homes to save energy, reduce costs, increase reliability and transparency. It sounds nice, doesn't it? Secondly, it's a nickname, another way to look at it, it's a nickname for an ever widening palette of utility applications that enhance and automate the monitoring and control of electrical distribution. Okay, now, I know most of you are pretty much in sync of this already. Here's an idea of, uh, <clears throat> of this idea of smart grid, and you can see up here um, over here where we have the meter, uh, it's a little fuzzy, but there's the power meter in your house. And this blue ellipse right here is called the HAN, the Home Area Network. It's like, kind of like a, you know, like, a little bit like the internet, in, but the Home Area Network just means you locally. It's connected to your itty bitty weeny teeny electric car that you're all going to own someday. <laughs> And, and your washer and dryer and your thermostat. Maybe you'll be driving your dryer, I don't know. But um, all the electrical things in your home are connected to the meter, which in turn goes out and connects to the power pole. And uh, the idea is that the meter communicates in both directions with everything in your home and everything in the utility outside the home. The green ellipse to, is the uh, NAN, or the neighborhood area network which communicates with your neighbor's smart meters and their appliances to uh, you know help you all balance out and get along together and so on with the energy you have available in your neighborhood the WAN the the pink one here is the uh, basically just the wide area network at that point which means that the data from your meters and your appliances are then broadcast into a broader context uh, to be picked up and delivered uh, back to the utility and back ultimately to the Department of Energy. Switch back to technocracy with me now. There's two senses of this word with a small t and a capital T. Let's do the small t first. Webster's defines technocracy as government by technicians. We can understand that. Management of society by technical experts. We can understand that. Think Obamacare, for instance, health care. Okay, this is ruling by committee, by software, by data, whatever. Technocracy with a capital T, however, includes that, but has a, a radically new concept that you need to get your hand around. Technocracy proper proposed a replacement economic system, a replacement economic system, not a new, not just new shuffled, replacement economic system based on energy distribution and consumption run by engineers, scientists, and technicians. This is the new economic order, I am convinced at this point. You just, you don't have to agree with me, but I'm convinced of that at this point, that this is the new international economic order that these yahoos had in mind from the get-go. It's just taken them about 30 years to get here to where they can circle us to do it. And I'll show you now a couple of things why. Technocracy, Inc. originated at Columbia University in 1932. It was... Um, uh, founded by M. King Hubbard and Howard Scott. Howard Scott fell into a, uh, anonymity after that, 